Thank you, Barbara. Well, hello. I am Catherine Moore, and I am a story doctor. Well, actually, I have my PhD in English literature, and I teach English at the upper school at Moravian Academy. Now, some of you may be wondering, so what's the deal with the lab coat? Well, I'll tell you how I got that lab coat. A few years ago, a very cheeky student of mine whose uh, parents were physicians declared to all of the class that he was not going to call me Dr. Moore, but Mrs. Moore. He further explained that his parents believed that the title of doctor belonged only to those with a medical degree. Well, the class was very entertained, and I encouraged that student to address me with academic respect, and then we moved on. But this conviction of this student not only led me to develop my persona as the story doctor, but also helped me reimagine how I see my work in the classroom. I believe that my discipline, English literature, benefits immensely when we treat it like the sciences, with time in the laboratory, experiential activities, and research out in the field. In my classroom, or my story laboratory, we practice narrative medicine. Now, my narrative medicine field also suggests, my narrative medicine field suggests, there we go, that um, my narrative medicine field means two things. Number one, that the stories we analyze and create undergo clinical trials, if you will, directly on people. We work with others to collaboratively understand, analyze, and create stories. And my narrative medicine field also suggests that narratives function as medicine. Narratives or stories have a palliative, curative, and transformative effect. And we see this happen each year in my story laboratory. Well, my story laboratory's genesis begins with this flower, actually. It's a chrysanthemum. I inherited a short story course in 2007. It, it was a basic sh uh, short story anthology course of short fiction where we would read stories, we would discuss stories, and we would analyze stories. I had mostly second semester seniors who were more or less, well, you guessed it, mostly less inter interested in doing the reading the discussing and the writing about stories. I was so desperate for someone just to care about stories. And for two years, I taught this way, this formulaic way. And I was beyond frustrated. I thought about these seniors as first graders. Where did the wonder go? I began, fixa I began to be fixated on this idea of reanimating my seniors' imagination and desire for stories. Well. That reanimation happened when we were reading two short stories about chrysanthemums, Odor of Chrysanthemums by D.H. Lawrence and The Chrysanthemums by John Steinbeck. And I was so desperate for someone to care, I gave them an experiential worksheet. And this worksheet right here demanded action. Over the weekend, the worksheet said, go out and find flowers, talk to florists. Once you have your flower, smell it, taste it, paste it onto your worksheet, and then answer the questions. So when Monday arrived, the whole classroom was abuzz with activity. Not only had they gone out to try to find flowers, and um, a lot of them expressed difficulty in getting their flowers because I had not realized that uh, chrysanthemums are really a fall flower, and it was the springtime. <laughs> so they had a lot of stories about how difficult it was to get chrysanthemums. But not only did they talk about that, but they talked about special flower moments in their lives. I was flabbergasted at their level of engagement. And with about five minutes left to the period, I brought it back to Steinbeck and Lawrence and said, why, above all other flowers, did Steinbeck and Lawrence really use the chrysanthemum? All the hands were raised. Everyone started talking at once, and I knew what I needed to do. I needed to get my classroom in the laboratory. So I had, I had my idea of the laboratory, but then I needed a structure for the course. So I decided to model and organize the course to mirror the three acts of our lives. Act one, our beginning. Act two, where we are in the prime right now. And act three, our elder years. So act one becomes 
sharing stories, the power of narrative. We work with first graders as our field work. And we read, short, we read short stories about children. We read folk tales and fairy tales. In Act Two, we tell stories. We tell our own personal stories. We read first person narratives. And our field work is with our own peers. And then Act Three becomes working with senior citizens from a local uh, senior citizen retirement community called Country Meadows. And we work with them to cull their life stories. And so let me tell you, uh, I'm going to share with you a moment from each of these acts to show you not only what the, what the story laboratory does, but also the power of narrative medicine. Now, Act One. A student of mine, former student of mine, uh, subtitled Act One, uh, Imagining Together. His name was Damien. And Damien hated stories, hated English literature. And he contended that stories were just made up lies after all. And what meaning could stories ever have for him? He actually uh, admitted freely he didn't care about stories and didn't really have any skill in finding their meanings. Well, all of that changed when he worked with his first grade partner, Rohan. Rohan loved stories loved imagining, loved words, and loved Damien. And this is, this is a drawing of their uh, first ice-breaking activity together. Rohan and Damien huddled around Rohan's little desk, and they were instructed to just draw together and imagine what they would have in their bedrooms. Well, <laughs> Damien was so amazed at Rohan's fertile imagination and incorporated some of his designs into his drawing. And Rohan just thought Damien was just so cool. And so he put some of his designs in his own drawing. Their collaborative story that they made together called William versus Mr. Cruel uh, incorporated some of their original icebreaking activity ideas and also inserted themselves into the story. Now, William versus Mr. Cruel is the classic tale of the good wizard versus the bad wizard in outer space with the ultimate redemption of the bad wizard and the ensuing friendship of William and Mr. Cruel. Well, this act changed Damien's perspective on stories entirely. He actually thought it was fun to analyze this story. This is a worksheet we did that uh, uses Bruno Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment in order to analyze the first grade uh, collaborative story. He actually, uh, Damien actually said to me, this was fun to do, and that's awesome. In his final lab report, Damien mentioned that this act completely changed his life and made him think about the power of stories. And so we learn in Act One that the narrative medicine of Act One shows us that stories, even made up ones, are important and that they really matter. Also in Act One, we've had the uh, lovely opportunity to be able to collaborate with our uh, video production class. And what we've done is made little films of these stories to, to bring these uh, first grade stories to life digitally. I'm going to close Act One with a video called Casey Loses Pancake. And you will see this story brought to life with the children's own illustrations. And enjoy. Casey Loses Pancake, written by Juliana Scott, Samantha Hadgedew, and Charlie Barnes. Once upon a time, there was a butterfly named Casey. Casey lived with her pet pancake in a pink volcano. Everything in Casey's world was pink, except for Casey and her pancake, which were both teal. But one day, the pet pancake got lost in the pink forest. Casey cried for a very long time when the pancake didn't return that day. The next day, Casey went out looking for the pancake. Casey went to the Purple People Zoo, but sadly, Casey could not find the pancake anywhere. Out of desperation, Casey went to the moon to hopefully find her pancake. After a long time on the moon, Casey got lost. Casey got so lost that she even fell off the moon. When Casey landed back on the world, she was very badly hurt. Casey was saddened so much by her failure to find the pancake that she began to cry. 
Meanwhile, the pancake was enjoying some magical maple syrup when suddenly he heard cries of Casey. The pancake got up and ran to Casey. Casey had a large boo-boo and could not walk. Seeing the pancake applied the magical maple syrup to her boo-boos. The maple syrup, in addition to being delicious, held magnificent healing powers. Once able to walk, Casey and her pet pancake headed back to the pink volcano and lived happily ever after. I hope you can see the wonderful collaborative effect that we've got going on here. Charlie was a big, strong lax bro, and uh, he had these two darling little first grade girls. And what united them was their love for pancakes. I hope you could see that. Um, and so in act two, we tell our personal stories. Now that may seem simple, but this is the part of the course where really uh, we start to see the softer side, as one of my students said this year in her final, exam, uh, her final lab report, we see the softer side of people. When we share our personal stories with each other, we're able to do that. Um, I'm going to uh, show you some of the things that students have said about this act of the course. Because of the stories I've heard of myself and others, I learned that our life's journey is essentially our journey to finding ourselves and coming to terms with who that person turns out to be. And when we do return to the stories that make us unhappy, and we finish them, we accept a chapter of our lives, and we continue writing the next one. In this way, we accept an imperfection that makes us who we are, learn from it, and move onward on the journey of self-discovery. Now, 16 and 17-year-olds uh, are writing this uh, about Act Two, and when we, we're just sharing our stories. Here's another one. To share these stories is an incredible personal experience. To share a deeper part of life can create bonds in any form of a social relationship. Act two of the course allowed us to delve into our minds and share our stories with each other. You gain respect for a person when they open their heart and soul to you. And the magical work of narrative medicine here in Act two. I know narrative medicine works to really make our class a community. And that's what I'm looking for each year with uh, Act two. This past year in Act Two, I had a group of wildly divergent personalities in my class. And even I was wondering, narrative medicine will work, we will, we will become this community, because it always happens. But even I was unsure. As a matter of fact, I had a student approach me in the beginning of the course and tell me he wanted to drop the course entirely. He thought the student, the other students in the class were too different from him and would impede his learning, and he would be miserable. I told him to give it a try. He did stay, and we listened to each other, and we listened to our stories. And not only did we become that community, we also invited other students, other peers, into our community. We started the peer-to-peer -peer story sharing project. And that is where we invited a couple students from, a lo from local public high school who were different perceived different from us in the socioeconomic status, cultural, culturally. Uh, and we had five sessions throughout the semester, Saturday mornings, very early. <laughs> and what our website did was to help us with those interstitial moments to get us from one, from one physical face-to-face -face meeting to another. And we had the best time. We did this project early on. Uh, well, of course, they would blog all the time and, uh, and uh, share some material, like we had a meme project, which they enjoyed, but the big hit of the semester was the selfie project. We uploaded so many selfies of each other, it was unbelievable. Um, and I am happy to report that the students discovered that selfies are not just about narcissism. That's very Actually, we were talking about how selfies help us to navigate our shifting landscape of identity. We really talked about very cool things, and we kept on taking selfies, and here they are. here's another one. But my favorite selfie is, at the end of the course, we were uh, asked to present our story work at a local writers' conference. And this is my favorite picture. This is at the beginning of our presentation at the podium. And we are still taking selfies of each other, of ourselves. And what I love about this picture is that 
We are still willing to share ourselves with others at our most vulnerable moment, speaking in front of a large group of people. And that willingness is such a testimony to this group of students that I had, where we really became a community. Oh, and that student who wanted to drop the course, on his final lab report for Act Two, his takeaway point was, listen to your peers. More to tell you about yourself than you could have ever imagined. And so the narrative medicine of Act Two cures us of our preconceived notions of one another and actually has the power to seal and strengthen us as a community. Well, we're on to Act Three, and one of my favorite moments of Act Three involves my student John and his Country Meadows partner, Mr. John Barth. And well, here they are. This is their official school picture, looking very stately there. But this is how I found them as I made my rounds at Country Meadows. This is, this is absolutely them. They, had, they were a riot together. <laughs> Mr. Barth was in memory support at Country Meadows, and uh, he couldn't remember much about his life, but what he did remember, he remembered stories about the Navy, shore leave, and women. Um, <laughs> And my student John wasn't academically aggressive. He didn't like school very much, but I think that every time he came back from one of these sessions, he was a, a little upset and agitated. He had nothing filled out on his worksheet. And he was getting nervous about this. And I would always ask John, well, did you have a good time talking to Mr. Barth? And John would always say, oh yeah, he told me this one great story about shore leave. And then he one time he was like, no, John, that's fine. <laughs> did you have a good time? That's great. When it came time for John to present Mr. Barth with a creative project, and a creative project is something um, performed, uh, artistically rendered or written, some, some kind of expression uh, that, uh, of the partner's life or the, uh, the time that the two partners uh, shared together, John panicked. He had no biographical data like the other people in the class for their partners. And so I reminded John that he played the piano, and that counts as artistic expression, creative expression. And so at our final celebration, John played this, his own original piano piece called Across the Sea, and it was supposed to represent Mr. Barth's time in the Navy. And it was a lovely expressive tune. And while John played it at our final celebration, Mr. Barth watched John, and tears were streaming down his face. And soon everyone at, John's, at, at Mr. Barth's table had tears streaming down their faces, and soon I was crying. And John could not get over Act Three and what it gave him. He wrote on his final lab report that he, he, he was flabbergasted that he could have a deep relationship with a man who didn't remember his name from week to week. John was an avid World of Warcraft player. He loved online gaming and interaction, and he couldn't fathom this, that it had so much power over him. And so the narrative medicine of Act Three shows, taught John patience and empathy and shows us that every human life is beautiful and important. Well, my story laboratory does not use the traditional formula of reading, discussing, writing about stories. Instead, my students explore story in action outside the classroom in collaboration with others. Each year, I say to the students, if you devote yourself 100% to the work of the course, the course could change your life. In the beginning, they are skeptical. But by the end of the course, I read their final lab reports, and I see what amazing discoveries they've made about themselves, about their lab partners, and about what really is important in life, the ability to know yourself and to understand others. Here are some final lab report uh, statements. This class has changed my life in a way much bigger than I can write on paper. I regret not learning imp the importance of stories in my life sooner, but I will be forever grateful for the positive impact it has made on my life. Here's one more. This class allows me to think beyond the limits of how the world works and focus my attention to how humans work, but more importantly, how I work. And students have written things like, this course taught me more than knowledge. This course taught me wisdom. Uh, when they write things like that, I smile, because I know it wasn't me. Uh, yeah, the students gain wisdom themselves. Yes, I facilitated the activities, but the students themselves, in effect, self-medicated with narrative medicine. And so, 
if your discipline isn't already in the laboratory, I invite you to try it. And if your discipline is already in the laboratory, I invite you to procure some narrative medicine. And the awesome thing about narrative medicine is that you don't need to be a story doctor to take it, nor to dispense it. And you don't need a prescription. Although, as your official <coughs> story doctor, I would recommend for optimal results that you listen to and tell stories at least twice a day. Side effects may include wonder, joy, curiosity, empathy, reflection, and above all, transformation. So, if you're ever feeling despondent, disconnected, or just know what life's all about, just take two stories and call me in the morning. Thank you very much.